good morning, good morning, and Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. Happy Wednesday, everyone. I appreciate you tuning in. We have some great guests today. I'm going to meet some new friends. I have a returning friend, and we are going to have an interesting conversation. But I'm going to ask you to do what I always ask you to do, and that is to go out and be an evangelist for the Roundtable Talk Show. There's some business owner, some entrepreneur, some friend who needs this information. Maybe they're just starting their business. Maybe they want to get to a million clients or over a million dollars in sales. They can tune into the show, but they won't have this information unless you go ahead and share it with them. Because like I always say, friends don't let friends miss out on the round table talk show. So while you're going ahead and texting and tweeting and inboxing your friends and letting them know about the show, I'm going to introduce a very special friend of mine, a very special guest, Mr. Jim Estill. He is the president and CEO of Shipper B and Dan B Appliances. Jim is currently CEO of both and a new venture that is revamping outdated shipping channels into a system that is better for consumers, retailers, and the environment. Jim is a Canadian technology entrepreneur, executive, and philanthropist. He started his first computer distribution business from the trunk of his car while in university and grew that business to $2 billion in sales. And he has the best quotes. Good morning, Jim. How are you? Excellent. Good morning, Sharifa. We're going to have to change my bio, though, because I sold Shipper B about three weeks ago, which is the goal. You start, business, <laughs> my, start the business and move it on and sell it. And so I am still CEO of Danby Appliances, but being CEO of two companies was uh, a little bit much anyway. So that's what I'm doing now is refocusing on my Danby Appliance business. Wow, Jim, you sold Shipper B. We talked about Shipper B so much, but you had, okay, how did you just up and sell a business since we last spoke? Well, that, that's what we do. We build a business with the purpose of selling. So basically, uh, we knew we were going to sell it and we just went out, talked to some people. Um, and it, it works better if you're trying to sell to more than one person because then you're able to get a better, uh, a better bid. And then uh, you do all the boring stuff, all the legals and stuff like that and, uh, and make it work. But it's a, it's a good outcome. And uh, I believe we will still have a, a long-term impact on the courier business in North America because it's being bought by a company that will expand it, take it North America wide. So uh, I'm very, I'm pleased with it. I, I'm excited. I, I'm, that's great news. So, Jim, let me tell you, you're not one of those people I know that's not just about to go golfing. So what are you planning? What are you up to? What are you about to do next? Well, you see that you're right. I'm the most boring person. I don't even know why you bother have me on my on your show here. But um, I will do what I always do. I will focus on business, which is now refocus on Danby Appliances. And I'm excited by that business, just like I am on all businesses. So for me, it's back to Danby Appliances. Okay, but I love talking about Danby appliances because almost every show that we do, there's someone who says, I have a Danby or I saw a Danby. And the last time we were on the show, we talked about how the pandemic has affected sales for Danby appliances. What's, what are people raving about? Well, I mean, the big thing is everyone's worried about food uh, storage and it's just, they need more freezer space. So freezers you cannot make enough freezers and deliver them fast enough there's still a shortage of freezers our place in refrigeration and refrigerators we're big on second refrigerators and and so fridge for your basement fridge for your garage fridge for your uh, your den and again huge demand because people are saying i don't want to go to the grocery store every week i want to store more food so and even wine coolers are selling well because people are entertain at home and uh, stay at home improve your home so the trends are all going in our favor so yes I, I can imagine because I know one of the things that happened to me personally during the pandemic is I started having one of my neighbors she's 99 years old she thinks the world is going to hell in a handbasket and so she says we have to have enough food and so what she decided to do is disperse food at everyone's houses so she started putting her food in my freezer and I'm like well where am I supposed to put my food? And so I had to go and buy a new appliance. And I definitely checked to see if it was a Danby. Good for you. You should have emailed me. 
I will. I will. Next, but no, you know what? I'm gonna save that because I want the wine cooler. That's that's really what I want. I want a, oh, a Danby wine cooler. That's the only way to get through a pandemic for sure. Yes, yes. Are you coming to my 45th birthday party on the 31st, Jim? You know, you know how I organize my life? I have to ask my assistant Sherry. I don't okay. know. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk to Sherry because I'm going to need that wine cooler for my birthday because I'm going to have to relax after all of this. Now, Jim, I always love speaking with you, but I'm going to go ahead. I'll come back to you, but I want to introduce my next guest, Ms. Kathleen Steffi. Kathleen is the CEO and founder of Naviga Recruiting and Executive Search. For 19 years, Naviga has been helping domestic and global business leaders achieve revenue growth by recruiting top performing sales and marketing professionals. Kathleen's background has given her unique insight into the corporate talent acquisition world, agency recruiting, and what it takes to manage and lead a team of marketers and recruiters in the digital landscape. Good morning, Kathleen, how are you? I'm doing really good. Thanks for the intro. You are so welcome. Do you have a Danby appliance? I don't. I don't. Um, so can good you to cut, know. Can you can you just shut her off then? Uh, <laughs> Mute. <laughs> no longer allowed on the show per Jim. I'm just giving you a hard time, Kathleen. Tell us about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? And what are you passionate about? Oh my gosh. I love that question. Um so I run Naviga. I started it um, 19 years ago, and we place sales, marketing, and operations people for companies around the world. Um, we only specialize in sales, marketing, and operations, um, and I just love what I do. I have a, a team of, of people who help me do it that are awesome, and um, you know, I used to be in corporate recruiting and corporate recruiting leadership. And so that's when you were introing me kind of a unique blend there. You don't normally find people who are on the corporate side and then go and, and grow an agency to help businesses around the world. But um, I decided to do that and it's grown ever since. And I just love it. Even after no, all the years. <laughs> 19 years. Most people can't in business can't get through nine months, you know? Yeah. So to be in 19 in business for 19 years, I think that's amazing. What would you say is the secret to your success? Um, I shrug a lot off. <laughs> um, I shrug a lot off. Um, I pivot, I change, I make decisions quickly. Um, the decisions that fit decisions that are quick, like for an example, um, I don't make them all quick, <laughs> you know, I really, really important decisions are thought through, but um, I'm able to, to make decisions on the fly, um, leading a great team that stayed with me for many years and just attracting really, really good employers um, through our marketing. So that's, that's what's done it, you know, and they keep coming back year over year. Now, again, I, I love this idea of the fact that it's 19 years. What are some of the changes that you see in your industry and in your business over the last two decades? Yeah, well, overall, marketing in the industry has completely changed. I mean, the landscape in the world for marketing has changed, you know, from um, now, now that we're on digital platforms and, and all that jazz. So um, if you're not relevant in that space, um, you're basically behind, way behind now. And we started very early on um, with doing blogs, um, email campaigns, social, you know, um, in the 2000s, I was doing Google PPC and I had a massive spend on it. Um, so the change is mostly in marketing and we did that early on. Um, but in recruiting, just tools have changed, you know, to find people as well. A lot of different tools. Obviously, LinkedIn is a predominant beast out there to do that. Um, but then there's other platforms that you know you need to have moved on and used now in order to be relevant and smart and enjoying the world at where they are. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned you had a, a huge ad spend for Google. Has that remained consistent over the years? Have you seen it increase? Is reduced? Uh -huh. What is the spend? Well, we now we're zero. Um, okay. We're zero, but it used to be really a hundred thousand um, dollars. We were spending on Google PPC, 
And so that's what started kind of this baseline of um, employers knowing about us. And we just, you know, capitalized on that where, you know, we started decreasing the spend, you know, um, each year, each quarter. And then we saw, wow, okay, we have this organic situation happening to us where we created a boomerang and employers were just coming to us without that spend. So, um, and like I said, it, we've been doing that. We, we did that a long time ago. Um, so it's kind of like having a, a billboard up in the same location on Google for 19 years. So um, it, it's beautiful. Our lead source and how many leads we get every single week as a result of our marketing over the years. So Mm, very interesting. I had that conversation many times. If you're doing it right, you should be able to reduce your ad spend. Your ad spend is continuing to go up. People aren't responding. You're not getting new customers and new clients. Kathleen, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to go ahead and introduce my very next guest, Miss Lee. Hayes. Lee is the founder of Path to the Main Stage. As a professional speaker agent, she knows that value of getting on stages. Small business owners can create a personal brand and increase sales by connecting with audience. Lee teaches them how. Good morning, Lee. How are you? Good morning. I am excited to be on your show. I am excited to have you. Now, you have quite a few people on the wall behind you. Tell us about those people. I do. This is my wall of heroes. So I run a program called Path to the Main Stage, which you mentioned, but my company is Go Leeward, which is a speaker management company. So the, the hero, the wall of heroes that I have back here is a diverse group of mind-blowing people who are professional speakers who speak in the business arena. So from different aspects of, of speaking. But I have people that when I tell people about them, they go, oh, that, like they're amazing people. They're not just, oh, another guy who talks about, you know, leadership or another guy who talks about marketing or it's, um, and again, it's, and being that I only have 12 people, amazing diversity. And it's because there's so much strength in diversity. It's not that I've gone out looking for different people. I go out looking for amazing people and you can find amazing people anywhere, everywhere. So what do you do for them? Um, so for the speakers I manage, these are professional speakers who are in the business. And when you go to their website and say, oh, I want Michael to speak, I want Emmanuel to speak, those leads all come to be. I do the contacts, I do the negotiation, I do the contracting. But then on the other hand, I develop clients who come to me and say, we're going to put on this huge event. Can you help us with speakers, either with your own or finding people and that's why I started the Path to the Main Stage program is because there's so many people who want to get going with speaking and don't know how to do it or do it wrong. And then, you know, they'll be like, Lee, for the last two years I've been trying and I haven't gotten on, a, I haven't gotten a single gig. I don't know why. And so I'm able to sit down with them and say, all right, this is what you need to do. Because like you mentioned at the beginning, it's speaking nowadays is important if you want to be a speaker and get paid to speak. But it's also important if you want to, if you own a brand, right? I mean, Jim, you are your brand. I'm sure you're the face of your brand. And the more people you get out there, the more people know, like, and trust you, right? Kathleen Sales, know, like, trust. The more people are likely to buy from you. I love how we're tying this all together, right? Yes. Um, so, but, but those are the different aspects. And speaking is a huge know, like, trust aspect of it. People know your face, your brand, who you are they can buy from you then. Yes, in the last year, the speaking industry is one of the industries that has just been destroyed. Wow. I mean, you have people who are used to traveling the world, speaking at so many different places. And then you mentioned huge events. There haven't been any huge events. So what has the last been the last year been like for you, your business, your clients? I'm sure you had to pivot in some form or fashion. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Pivot. Ever been on a roller coaster and you know, you're going up the hill and up, up the hill and you get to the edge and then yes. you stand up and just scream all the way down. Um, yes. That's been made the last year. It's been like, ah, you know, all the way down. Um, so we had waves. The first wave was companies panicking, canceling, postponing, going, what do we do? Right. Last spring, everything got canceled or postponed for the fall. 
a lot of people didn't want to go virtual because virtual was scary at the time. We're, I mean, people are still figuring out how to do the virtual thing. <clears throat> and then the fall came where all the people had rescheduled for last September, October, November. And, you know, COVID lasted more than two weeks. I know in the beginning we said it was a two-week thing. It actually was more than two weeks. So now we had the second row of cancellations. Um, but you know what? Now companies are getting it. They're starting to do hybrid events. Uh, I'm getting events. I mean, things are picking up. And I think that is a precursor for the whole business world because I get to see the early entry. If people are starting to plan events now, that is the sign that things are opening up for the future. And it's happening. I'm getting calls every day now. Okay, that's good. So we're going to get on that list. So when we come back, when we bring you back on the show, Lee, we're going to have a picture of Sharifa Hardy. I want, I want that <laughs> bottom corner right by the light. It's going to be everybody, Sharifa Hardy, right there the next time you come back. And I'm going to come back to you, Lee, but I want to go ahead and introduce yeah. our next guest, Miss Barbara Paldus. Barbara is born of Czech parents, raised in both Europe and Canada, fluent in five languages with a PhD from Stanford University. Dr. Barbara considers herself a global citizen. As a scientist, she believes in data and biotechnology. The Codex was conceived from a need to deliver high efficiency skincare collections that defy the mainstream with science-based effective ingredients. From top to bottom, she's created a line that puts the plant power back in your hands with the results to back it up. Good morning, Dr. Barber. How are you? Good morning, Sharifa. Doing great. How are you? I'm excited to have you here. Five languages. Wow, I'm impressed. Yeah, English is my third language, so it's a little, and I don't say A anymore. So Jim, I used to, when I first came to California, <laughs> I said A a lot, and everybody was like, you must be from Canada. And it was like, how can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a Canadian thing, Jim? Well, it is. You know, when I moved to Canada, I didn't speak any English. And, oh. I, and I was actually illiterate when I came to Canada. Are you being serious, Jim? I'm deadly serious. Okay, we're going to come back to you. Uh, yeah, what language did you speak, Jim? I'm curious. Like, well, I actually was nine months old, so I didn't actually speak anything. Jim, see, I told we're going to ignore Jim. Barbara back, to, Barbara, back to you in the studio, okay? Tell us about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? What are you passionate about? Barbara. So I'm a prototypical nerd. If you haven't, oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I'm a prototypical nerd, if you haven't figured that out already. Um, so I basically have been a serial entrepreneur for the last 20 years. Um, I did graduate with a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford, so I guess that makes me an even worse nerd. And <laughs> my first company I started was actually for global climate change. So we created instrumentation for measuring carbon cycle, food, And so it's cool now to watch like the equipment, you see publications in nature. It's been on Mount Everest. You know, my, my former equipment travels more than I do these days. Um, <laughs> and then my next company, Finesse Solutions, that I spent about 12 years in that I sold to Thermo Fisher in 2017, um, we made um, automation equipment for manufacturing of drugs and vaccines. And so I would say today, like my biggest accomplishment is that the Pfizer and the Johnson and Johnson vaccines are being manufactured in my equipment. So that is like my, that was my. Congratulations, Barbara. Congratulations. Wonderful. So we have Barbara, we have her equipment, we have Pfizer using it. I'm going to come back to you, Barbara. I want to go ahead and introduce my next guest. Network. It's, Sorry. No, no, no. It's okay. Uh, I, I'm going to come my back. Network, my, my network kind of in and out. So what happened was that my he was born, he had a rare allergy to a preservative called phenoxyethanol. Yeah, it's a mouthful. And it took me three years to figure out what it was. Now, it turns out that the preservative is totally safe, although France has challenged the European Union on safety for children under three. But all this research, you know, I started going to manufacturers, asking them, like, what could it be? Going to the doctor, we did every single patch test, like, you know, the little 
pricks that they put on the back and seeing if anything was, you know, causing the allergy. And it took me like literally seven years to figure this out. And so after I sold my company to Thermo Fisher in 2017, I wanted to do something that would stop and change and innovate in preservatives. You know, why are preservatives important? You don't want mold. You don't want your cosmetic products to go bad. If you get E. coli, you can imagine how bad that would be. And so that's when I started Kodak. So this is Kodak. And one of the things we've done this year, because that was the other thing that was really bugging me, was, you know, I'd be buying all these products and I'd read all these claims and I'd be like, well, how do they measure this? So I'm a measurement person, again, a geek. <laughs> and, and so it was kind of like, well, they say that it's this amazing hydration system. Well, how do they measure that? And then again, you call the company and they're like, well, we can't discuss that. You know, that's confidential information. It's like, yeah, but if I buy a cell phone, they tell me how much memory it has. You know, if I buy a car, they tell me the zero to 60 acceleration speed and the gas mileage. Why can't I get any data on cosmetics and beauty? So we created, and you know how like when you buy food, you get a nutrition panel. So we basically this year put all of our measurements onto the box. And now we're going to educate people so they understand what it means. Because honestly, Sharifa, if you're spending a lot of money on skincare and it's not cheap stuff, um, we want people to know exactly what it's going to do because, you know, there's all this talk about, oh, the ordinary has an $8 vitamin C serum and Barbasterm has a $300 one. What's the difference? Well, if you have no data, how on earth do you know that the $300 one is way, way, way better than the $8 one? It might not be. So that's kind of my goal for the next 10 years is to change this industry. I love it. I love it. I love when people are disruptors and they come into a world and they just change it. I think that's beautiful. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Barbara, I have questions for you, but I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest, Mr. Jay Germo. Jay is a producer and distributor of specialty flavored honey and single pollen honey from around the world. Good morning, Jay. How are you? Good morning, Sharifa. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, you are so welcome. Where are you located, Jay? So um, I do all of my bottling in uh, Flint, Michigan, and my hives I have uh, spread around just south of that uh, town called Linden. Um, uh, I live in the Novi area outside Detroit, but um, a lot of my partner hives are in, they're all over the place. I have some in Hawaii, some in Florida, some in Norway, some in Italy. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm located in Michigan and, uh, I, uh, Jim and I were, uh, uh, batting some comments around before we got started, how, uh, I think our climates are pretty much the same. So, um, uh, struggling with, uh, temperatures in the winter is kind of the, that's kind of the bane of this industry. Mm, I can imagine. Now you keep, you mentioned hives. How did you get into Honey, how did this all come about? Um, it was it was kind of an accident. Um, I worked in uh, direct mail uh, analytics and sales for a long time. And um, when 2008 happened, um, I went through a bankruptcy. I lost my job. I pretty much lost everything. I ended up moving in uh, to my grandmother's basement. Um, I, I was pretty much almost destitute. I think I was down to like $150. And I got picked up by a uh, bank as a cost analyst. Um, and after about a year, I took a uh, tour around the state just to visit some uh, old stomping grounds and see some relatives. And a cousin of mine has been a commercial beekeeper for, oh, probably 20 years. And we stopped in and I stopped in, had a conversation with him and he had been producing uh, a couple of flavored honeys that he had sold locally at his market. Um, and he mentioned to me sort of on an aside, you know, if somebody wanted to, they could take this down to the Detroit area and do okay with it, quote unquote. That's how, it, that's actually exactly how he said it. Um, so I thought about that for like three weeks and then I took him up on the offer popped up a tent in my local uh, farmer's market. And I basically sold out in, I don't know, maybe four hours. Um, and actually the fourth customer I had, she was asking about, she really had a, a strong positive reaction to uh, um, the lemon ginger honey that we produced. And uh, 
she asked me what other flavors I had. She's like, I'm going to bring the entire, the entire women's group here next week. Uh, we're going to clean you out. So I just started, just started making up things and uh, <laughs> went back up to the farm and said, all right, we're going to come up with plum and coconut and peach and amaretto and chili pepper. And um, my cousin's wife wasn't a big fan of it at the time, but 10 years later, um, I kind of broke off from them and have just been building it up ever since. Okay, so how many flavors do you have? Between all of my single pollens um, and the flavors, probably like 70. 70 flavors of honey? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So are you one of those people that just sleep at night and just, you know, dreaming and all of a sudden it's like chocolate chip honey, like all of a sudden it just comes to you? Not exactly, but that's a good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> The I need royalty. <laughs> I, I have I have two chocolate honeys right now, but chocolate chip is that's not that's not a good idea. We'll, we'll talk about a split after this is over. Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah, Don't the big, the big challenge I'm I'm really kind of facing is how to scale properly. Um, mm -hmm. so like when Jim said, you know, the goal is to uh, end up selling your business. I'm like, God, is it? Because um, I like what I'm doing, but I know eventually it's just going to become too physically taxing. And scaling to the level that like Jim is at, where you have, I don't necessarily have employees, I have partners who help me out with various functions. But um, Jim was kind of right in that. It would be great to get to a spot where you can just say, here's the asset um, and here's the, um, the annual revenue stream. How can I uh, reposition it and push it off? Because Time is really what's my uh, my biggest challenge right now, and um, it's a fun job. It's absolutely the, the best thing I've ever done. But um, yeah, you, I went from having a job that I wasn't really, that I didn't really care about, and the idea of being in love with something, as far as work, was kind of alien to me. To now, I have that, but I don't have any time anymore. <laughs> yes, I understand it. So we're gonna go over to Jim. Jim. How does Jay get to walk in your shoes? Well, uh, you know, I sold my first business when I built to $2 billion and I was retired for five years. Now, during that time, Not I was- you. Uh, well, <laughs> no, I, I, that's what you say. But I was, I, know. I was sitting on some boards. I was doing, you know, some angel and venture capital and stuff like that. But during that time, I realized I don't want to be retired mm -hmm. because retirement's overrated. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I happened to sit on the board of Danby Appliances. The CEO resigned. I said, oh, I can go in and run that for a while. I started running it. So great. That'll be my next decade gig because I enjoy running a business of a certain scale. Um, mm -hmm. The problem I had when I was doing all the little startup investing and stuff in that interim five-year period is when you're startup, you have to actually do a lot of things. When you, <laughs> when, you got, uh, when you do 400 million in sales, I don't have to do anything. I just show up wherever I'm told to show up. It's, uh, it's easy. So, um, so the issue is I just sold Shipper B, but I still have Danby appliances. So I'm not, I, I'm worried if you go and sell it, what is your next story? Now you can always have a next story, but to think you need to build it, to sell it, to retire, that's not necessarily the best plan in my uh, experience, my personal I may experience. have misspoke a little, Jim, and like, I like the idea of I mean, it's, it's really become kind of my identity at this point, but I'm always fascinated by entrepreneurs who have, um, well, a couple things. They have a revenue stream in place that will allow them, I'm leery of employees, but um, scalability. You can have partners that can blow out your sales to do, let's say, $20 million right now. I'm doing a lot of things manually right now. Um, and to ramp up to that next level, that would be, that would be the cat's meow to me to so, so what's down the, down the line, maybe, but for right now, I'd like to just ramp up volume. So, so what, I, what I always did, I started from zero and then I'd mm -hmm. study what do people doing 10 million do? And then I sort of 
did that? And what do people doing 50 million do? Then I did that. Then what do people doing 100 million? What do people doing 500 million? What do they do when they're doing a billion? So I always studied sort of one step ahead of where I was. And one thing I learned is it tends to not be what do I need to do? What more do I need to do? It tends to be what do I not do? Uh, it tends to be what do you give up as you gr grow to a bigger um, level? That's yeah. my experience. Yeah, I see you nodding, Barbara. What are your thoughts? It's all about building the team and building a team you can trust. So um, having built, you know, one company up to 100 million and one company up to close to 100 million before we sold it, um, it was, th there's no way you can do all of that yourself. Now, I ended up still running a lot of the sales because even though you're a company that size, if you're talking to, you know, a Roche or a Genentech or a, Advisor, you know, you're like a tiny little ant. And so the CEO is still the main salesperson to like, a, you know, $100 million, $100 billion pharma company. But I, I was still traveling way too much, which was why I actually sold my last company because I had no, I was not home. Like I was traveling three weeks out of the month. So I totally, totally understand the, you know, at some point that's not scalable. And we also, needed, you know, the projects were very capital intensive. So I don't know if the beekeeping industry is really capital intensive or you can like rent hives, um, but it's all about the team and hiring the right people and then trusting those people and empowering the people. That's the only way you're going to scale. And I, yeah, I would that's not like point, the hive. Yeah. The hive component isn't really the big thing. The big thing is more bottling and uh, then unloading distribution. The hives kind of I don't want to say they take care of themselves, but that's not, you can underwrite hives and create splits with beekeepers um, if you want to have more uh, production. But um, yeah, the, the mechanics afterward is where it gets a little tricky, at least for me. But can you find a good bottling partner? Like that? Yeah, you know, actually that I have found somebody who does uh, specialty packaging and they're local. I don't necessarily want to use their packaging um, uh, proprietary um, uh, package, but, um, you know, it's a, what I have is a very viscous fluid, um, and you have to make it worth somebody's while. I think, uh, the first person I was in contact with wanted, like for each flavor, they wanted me to commit to like a, a semi tanker full, which is a lot. That would be, you know, that'd be an outlay of, you know, a couple million bucks for all the different stuff. I, and I, I can't do that. And that's just for, that's just for one component of um, production. So yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess really, Barbara, I'm just going to underscore what you're saying and that finding the right person who's both uh, um, strategically positioned near me or somewhat near me and can handle up to a particular volume and who is willing to grow with me. That's, but I mean, that's really everybody's challenge when you're trying to find new people to work with. Well, yes. So sure, Kathleen, you can ask yeah. Kathleen. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Kathleen knows how to find people, right? So well, it's interesting because I think owning your own business and making the decision to grow, it's very personal. Um, I'm part of an executive group and, you know, in January, I'm pressed as an owner to say, where do we want to go next year? Like in terms of year over year growth. And if I'm satisfied, <laughs> right, financially with the profitability and the income that is coming to me, why do I have to keep growing, right? It's like, why do I have to now grow it to 20% or, or 30% more if me, the, the one that's operating it and, and running it is satisfied? So my point in saying this is it's very subjective. It's very personal for the owner because you could be running a $400 million organization and making a hundred grand a year, you know, and then saying, I want right. to go throw it to X, Y, Z. And, you know, if you're not profitable, it doesn't matter. So, mm -hmm. you know, once you get to a point where you're running this thing and you're making a really good living, um, that fills your soul, not just financially, right? You can have balance. You could be at peace with things, have a good marriage, have, you know, raise your kids and be present and things like that. I think it's extremely dynamic to be able to say, I don't have to grow it <laughs> to a certain uh -huh. extent. 
maybe just a little bit for another challenge and to challenge the team. Let's keep growing it incrementally to whatever, but that's where I am. That's how, what I'm describing is exactly where I am after 19 mm -hmm. years. Yes. It sounds to me, just from listening to what you said, Kathleen, that there may have been doors or opportunities that were offered to you and you went, mm, no, I want to stay where I am because that would be too much work or that would be more intensive or that would require, you know, a 200 hour work week instead of the 140 hour work week I'm already doing. Yeah, there's been lots of things presented over the years and we've tried a lot of different things over the years. And it's, since I'm the one who designed it, it's really all about how it makes me feel, <laughs> like how challenged I am and do I feel good about doing that day in, day out? Because while owning a business is great, it's not what defines people and who we are. And um, it's, it's easy to get caught up in that in defining it through owning it. Um, I almost wish I did have the acquisition mentality because I think <laughs> it's the epitome of not getting caught up in, in, you know, defining yourself with the business, but something else happened to me like five years ago that helped push me to not associate myself, you know, with my business only. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Lee, do you associate yourself with your business? At this point I do absolutely because uh, my business is growing other people. So it's, it's part of who I am is helping all these individuals get on more stages, do more performing. And, and it's, it's so funny what you say about continuously growing. Um, I have such a kinship there with, <laughs> with Barbara. I worked for 454 Life Sciences, which was, take, which was uh, purchased by Roche. I worked for Core Informatics, which was purchased by Thermo Fisher Scientific. So I know that space. <laughs> we used to work with DNA, uh, uh, DNA sequencers. Um, and I have none of that knowledge, right? I was the HR person, but still <laughs> I, I know that that world. And in that world, when you're corporate, it's you always grow, like you have to grow, you have to grow, you have to grow because the board expects that your investors expect that there's no other option. But I believe in the other aspect, which is working for my own business is fulfilling. It mm -hmm. is I love doing it, mm -hmm. but right. But Jay, I also understand that for me to get bigger, right, I work harder. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've been doing is I've suddenly started enjoying myself more this year because I now have a part-time bookkeeper. I have my part-time social media person. I have, but they're all gig economy. So they're not my mm -hmm. employees, right? But they're real, but, and it takes a while to find people who are good, but being through the gig economy, wow, that just makes it so easy, right? That I can just go to Upwork and did a thing and I send my, my assignment out and I have my people and it just happens, you know? And I'll I don't have what? to worry about the payroll taxes and the-, the I'll tell you what, Lee, like um, I, I also run a blog um, for travel and uh, uh, honey pairing and, and uh, food tasting and, um, and the like. Mm -hmm. And it just occurred to me, I feel kind of dumb about this, but it, it occurred to me just sort of on a lark last summer that I don't have to write this. It takes me hours to write all this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, you hit mute. Jay, we lost you. To, uh, hold a conversation and build a narrative. And I can give another assignment to somebody else to do all the graphic work around it. Yep. It might cost me 10 bucks Ooh. and I don't have it's freed up my whole day or it's freed up two days. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a big, I'm a big, big fan of the gig economy because uh, to a serial entrepreneur or a, a little guy, you can get a lot done with not a lot of money. You can, you can. And to your point, right. I don't do my social media. I can't stand social media, but I do do videos. I do a video every single week. And when I act to truth be told, I do four to six at a time and then to ship them off and I do nothing for the next month. But just by doing those videos, she creates the blog, she creates my Facebook page, she creates, you know, so like you said, it's a 10 minute investment, and mm -hmm. then a low dollar per hour, because she's up in, uh, well, she's in Canada, but still doesn't charge me a whole lot comparatively to having an employee, but you can grow and do so much more and not do the stuff you don't want to do. That's right. the joy too, right, is offloading the stuff that doesn't bring you joy. Yes. 
So, Jim, you've grown these businesses. You started out the trunk of your car. Why keep building? Why not just say, you know what? I want to run a company. It can stabilize. It doesn't necessarily have to grow. Well, I am a growth junkie, but part of the reason for that is growth gives opportunity for my people. Mm. um, Like Barbara says, build a team but I need to give my team opportunity. So if I'm opening another factory, then all of a sudden I need another factory manager. I need a management layer and whatnot. So it gives people a career path. Um, I guess the other thing is when you make uh, appliances, it's all about, uh, there is economies of scale. So when you buy 11,000 tons of sheet metal, you get a better price than when you buy very little or whatever. So I need that scale because I'm in a highly competitive business. When people go to buy a refrigerator or freezer, they, they price me against every other refrigerator and freezer. Um, they don't say, oh, it's a Danby, so I'll, I'll pay you $100 more. They say, uh, is it a dollar more? Well, maybe I won't even buy you for a dollar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Jim, what I think we need to discuss then is your expansion to California. So when we go ahead and open that Danby facility in Long Beach, we'll have more opportunities here, Jim. How's that sound? Well, that, that sounds great. Are you uh, looking for a job, you're saying? Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm going to work for really, Danby really, Appliance. I'm really, really angling for that wine cooler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm I want some money too, Jay. Don't feel bad. <laughs> but you make a really good point, Jim, which is your business, economies of scale is everything, right? The more, the merrier. I think in the honey industry, I'm sure there's also economy of scale. However, 100%. you're also 100%. dealing in a, a in a specialty market, right, where... You, I mean, a refrigerator is a refrigerator. And I wish I had met you last week, Jim. I bought a refrigerator last week. Um, but with the honey, like you said, you have, I have never, you said the word ginger honey. And I went, ooh, like no yeah. one else has ginger honey. Everyone's yeah, got four fridge. different kinds of that. <laughs> but Lee, like the economies of skill is just like Jim said, like he does it with sheet metal. I do it with glass and plastic. Right, right. So like when I buy bottles, um, even the distributors and the sellers, they like they, it's been built into their pricing program. Like you'll save, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but 50 cents per bottle. If you buy an extra 3000 over the course up. of your acquisition, that adds up a lot. That bumps your margin considerably. And that all of those dollars, they go towards, um, you know, social media, uh, social media people and, uh, video people to do additional products to move your your brand down the line. So um, it makes sense, I, I think, especially when you're buying a thing, right? So it's a it's a I think service industry because I'm pure service industry might be a little bit less of economy of scale. I mean, I can get more speakers, but my speakers they don't want to do more; they want to do less for more, right? So it's about elevating each individual versus getting more and more and more individuals. So how do you scale your clients that are speakers? How do you scale them so that they have, uh, they receive more and do less? Well, a lot of it is what, you know, path to the main stage, which is your speakers are at different levels and there are tons and tons of $500 speakers, right? And then there are $5,000 speakers. Then there are $50,000 speakers. And it's, how do you get to that level? I know I worked with a speaker. I had a, somebody want me to hire him and they said he's $80,000. I go, are you kidding me? How often does he work? They go, oh, only once a year. It's not really what he does. But there, but somebody's worth is willing to spend eighty thousand dollars for him once a year. So it's just like a little bonus. But if you're making eight hundred dollars a talk, you can't do it once a year, right? You need to be talking all the time, even as a side gig. So it's how do you get to that next level that you're worth more, so you can do fewer, bigger gigs? Absolutely, Kathleen. You're at that fifty thousand, eighty thousand dollar mark. How do you get your speaking gigs? My speaking gigs? I just made that up, by the way. I just threw yeah. that out there. I'm like, really? I just gave you a number, a value. We're going to get you over there on Lee's wall. Okay. I, I, I'm not really into speaking. No? That's surprising. You have 19 years of business experience and no one asked you to speak? Um, I find that uh, incredible. I panels and things like that, but I don't really know the business model that you have, Lee. I'm, I'm assuming it's like a Tony Robbins situation. I mean... Like, and I'm, I'm not, I have no interest in that life. (laughs) And and that's, that's a good, that's a good analogy that that is, it is a lifestyle. Mm. Yeah. Right. It would change 
everything if I wanted to start doing that. I'd have to train for it, be coached about it, all that stuff. Like, I would have no interest in that. Kathy, you are interesting. Like, when I, I'm, people are adding work and trying to make you expand your company and expand your reach. And Kathleen's like, no, I don't want to do that. What, do you, what is your passion? You must have a sport, a hobby, kids, something that you would rather do than more work. No, it's honestly, I've grown my business year over year, each year, and it's it's a thriving business. I just, I, I have a really good skill to not take extra crap on. And mm. I... I Stay the course, and that's why I've been successful. So um, it it certainly has not limited my opportunities or the growth of the business. I just I know what I want and what I like, and I I know that I don't want to take stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, Barbara, how about you? You are you good at not taking stuff away? No, that's one of my biggest failures is then I end up working 20 hours a day. And, you know, I'm still, I still have my time blocked out for my son. That's kind of sacred time. But uh, yeah, no, I make it up in the evenings and in the early mornings. So I get it. One of the things I was going to actually ask is we talked about growth, but growth produces garbage, right? And one of my big pet peeves is climate change and recycling and ocean plastic. And that's one of the challenges, I guess, in my business is, how do we create a circular economy so that we can still grow, but we're not putting, you know, plastic crap out there all the time? And so I'd just be curious what people think about that, because how do you, you have to keep growing, um, as Jim said, especially if you want a business that down the road you can sell to somebody, they expect to see that growth, that's the corporate way, but then that means millions and millions of these little tubes, and yeah, you can create recycling programs, but part of our thing is that we say we we don't want you to buy all our products we only want you to buy what you need because too much product is not good for your skin either which is kind of ironic to be selling it like well just you know buy only one or two you know but don't buy everything we're not trying to sell you our whole line so i'd just be curious sharifa like Any, anyone in particular jay jim barbara i was curious like what you're talking about seems like it would it's almost like you're you're angling for like a paradigm shift in consumer psychology and like like for everything that I sell people try to bring my um, bottles back to me at the booth and like if they're recyclable products you can you can put in a recycling program but more people I talk to in recycling are like a lot of those programs create more waste uh, they consume a ton of energy so what I think what it does for you is it kind of opens the dialogue for yet further entrepreneurs to say, all right, we have this system in place for recycling, but it's got to change a bit because it's not totally efficient. So is that a combination of a change in consumer psychology for this lane for, for the cosmetic industry? Or are there partners to be had who can in some way utilize the waste better and I, forgive me barbara i don't know the industry but i'm spitballing a little bit here but that's how industries are really born for lack of a better way to open the conversation and, and, and you're absolutely it. right jay so that's what we are doing with our soap so first of all i did an analysis we calculated carbon footprint of soap like liquid soap you know like the the one with the pump and then just a bar soap and what i didn't realize was that the liquid soap was part of Unilever and the industry in the 50s. So you had World War II, right? The military instituted hygiene. So when the soldiers came home, they were trained to take a shower every morning, to brush their teeth every morning and night, you know, and wear deodorant. And so that's actually how the personal care industry was born in World War II, because before that, people had bar soap. And then the construction companies started putting showers. And you know how bar soap gets soggy and you drop it, and then it's kind of this gross little mess at the bottom of your shower. And so then the industry invented plastic containers and liquid soap. What I didn't realize is how many billion containers of that liquid soap are produced every year and where does all that garbage go right and so if you look at it then 
we're going, so we're trying to convince people to use bar soap again. So it's almost like back to the future. Um, mm -hmm. And there we can take all of our cuttings, then we can kind of shred them. And then kind of a couple times a year, we do a specialty soap where we recycle all those shreddings and they're all different colors and it looks really pretty. So we put them into another soap. So we do that for Earth Day and Ocean Day and Air Day. And we can use soy wax paper and a carton. No plastic involved. And so we can behavior to be more environmentally friendly. And then how do you do that with other products? Like things like this need to be in tubes. So it's kind of, as you said, maybe we need another, you know, G packaging genius or something. Well, I'll <laughs> yes. tell you what, like if I don't want to stay on the topic too long and like block out everybody else, but I hear, um, I would be interested to see if there's anybody out there who's throwing a considerable amount of money or investment or time towards cellulose packaging or an amplified cellulose packaging, because that'll break down. And um, from what I have read, break down cleanly. And for somebody of my size, I can't really use it um, for honey. I could just because they're considerably more expensive. But if the goal is just to take a deliverable something that you can move your product around in and that thing that you're moving it around in, not make a mess way down the line. That that's really kind of how you have to approach. I, I think it's more, it could be more of a material question. I think that's, that's true. I was thinking the same thing, Jay, because I know here in, in California, at least in Long Beach, we're not allowed to have plastic straws. You know, you, they have- And that's the a ones big chunk that, of my business. I do a lot of honey in sticks and at the markets, I've had tons of, uh, tons of people ask me, you think this is going to go the way of um, California where these things are showing up in tortoises noses. And like, I'm not opposed. If you have another way to deliver the product, people still want the product and people are adaptive, right? They, they will change. If I had a cellulose type product that, you know, would, was cleaner instead of, you know, showing up in the environment, you know, 20 days later, I think people would be receptive to it. I but, definitely yeah, agree. California leads the way on that for sure. Oh yes, we can't have um, straws and we cannot have plastic grocery bags. We are saving the earth. Now we are coming down to the last few minutes of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just simply allow my guests the opportunity to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who is watching this show live, as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives and let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance here today. And we're gonna start with you, Kathleen. It sounds like um, the biggest takeaway with Kathleen is maybe balance. <laughs> um, you know, you can grow your business and be very successful and be very intentional about it and have some balance in your life um, and, and just some peace at, at who you are. And, um, you know, I think that kind of bleeds out to my customers and how I can, you know, better serve them. So Maybe that's the biggest takeaway as I was listening to your feedback and things like that. I don't know. No, I like it. It's a strong point, you know, because I'm like that. I tell people I'm going to make sleeping into Olympic sport because I just love to just sleep and rest. And people are like, you got to do something. I'm like, I'm doing what I love to do. This is my thing right here. So I completely get it, Kathleen. At some point, it's you've had enough and you don't want to add more. Thank you. Lee, what do you have for us today? Well, what I profess is that business has changed. Business used to be a logo, right? It was a name. And with the onslaught of social media, and especially in a time of COVID when we're becoming so separated but connected through the social media, that CEOs and other leaders, entrepreneurs need to be the face of their business. They become their brand. And um, so I think people need to be more mindful of that, that right? Clubhouse, Facebook, all these things, you need to be out there and be your brand. Absolutely. Jay, are you out there? Are you the face of your brand? I'm out there every day. Um, I guess I would say, yeah, um, learn how to uh, learn how to leverage and uh, not just in terms of uh, growth, but figure out all the things that you don't want to do and that you don't thrive at and figure out how to 
slice and dice those tasks into somebody else cost effectively who does it better and faster than you do. Mm -hmm. So if people are interested in tasting, because I definitely have to try this <laughs> honey, if they're interested in it, where can they pick up a bottle? Uh, the best for out of state, out of Michigan people is uh, heyhoney.biz. Mm -hmm. So hey, honey, everything's that online, is. pick out what you like. I, we send it right to you. Okay. Do you have wine flavored honey? <laughs> See, you know, it's funny you say that. Uh, there is a local distillery in Ann Arbor, the Ann Arbor Distilling Company. And we took some honey down there to create a sherry, uh, mm -hmm. a couple different percent proof of uh, um, uh, honey infused uh, rye. Mm. So I'm working on it, but that's before you say anything, Jen, it's just, it's one of many, <laughs> many different uh, little avenues I'm going down with honey, but it was really, it was really popular. It's just from what I understand, uh, liquor distribution is it's, it's, it's tough to make money at it. Well, we'll have to bring you back and see, cause I need something for my Danby wine cooler. Jim, I'll see what do you have for us? Together for you, Sharifa. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you, Jay. Jim, what do you have for us? Well, Jay, you make mead out of honey. I, that's all I know really about mead and honey. Um, that consumes a ton of product, though. If you can make like a liqueur, you save a lot of honey and still end up with a good product. Great. The, mm -hmm. um, well, we were talking about, Barbara brought up the environment. And I would say that every business can have an impact in the environment. Um, in Danby Appliances, one thing we look at is durable and reliable. We sell decade appliances, one you don't have to replace for a decade. That has massive savings. Barbara, in your business, you could sell in slightly bigger containers. Instead of selling one month supply, sell a three month supply, sell a six months. That uses less plastic without having to do major technology. So uh, <laughs> that's good. I'll uh, pass it back to you, Sharifa. That's good, see, that, that advice from being a serial entrepreneur and just selling his business, Jim knows. Where can someone pick up a Danby appliance? Well, we sell through all major retailers, Costco, Home Depot, Lowe's, and uh, of course, Amazon, um, and Danby.com. Um, so we're readily available and we make about 2 million appliances a year. So it's quite, quite pervasive. Yes, I love it. Thank you for being here again, Jim. Barbara, what do you have for us? I would say know, know who you are, find your values, and then stick to them. Because as you grow the business, that becomes more of a challenge. So kind of make yourself a charter um, of things that are always going to be what you want to have happen and things where, well, you can compromise as situations change. And then you build a business that when you look back, bring to the world yes yes i have enjoyed this show immensely barbara where can people pick up your products so skinstore.com um, ships basically u.s wide and then on our website also codexbeauty.com and i'd love to send you some products to try sharifa if you're willing <laughs> Oh, I love to receive. I've been taking over the month of March. My birthday's on the 31st. The packages have just been arriving. So I'm going to get that honey, that wine cooler, that product. Kathleen's going to help me find a job. Lee's going to put me on her wall. Oh, I just love what I do. This has been a wonderful show. I have enjoyed speaking with all of you. I want to thank you for being guests on today's episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. And I especially want to thank everyone who tuned in to watch this show live, as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives. Just because you didn't catch the live show does not mean you're not important. It doesn't mean we still don't need your support. Because I do, I appreciate you, but I always ask, support our guests. They are here with you this morning to share their tips, their strategies, and their journey, their products, their services with you. So please support them. Their website link is in the Facebook post. But as always, please don't just visit the website. Please don't just share the show. Reach out to our guests. Follow them on social media. Send them that text. Send them that tweet. Send them that inbox. And when you do, please let them know. Sharifa Hardy, says hi. Now, if you're interested in more ways that I can help your business, or maybe you want to be a guest on the Roundtable Talk Show, please visit my website at AskSharifa.com. Until tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Pacific, everyone have a safe 
and a blessed day. Bye now.